that wants you to be a slave, a consumer. You have this code. You are just a consumer, a taxpayer, and you have nothing else. You are here to just produce, consume, produce, consume. That's it. And that's not life. Like earlier at the beginning, you said that there's a lot of distraction. Yeah. And we focus on the bits and ignore the essence of the thing, the most essential thing. And you said that Islam is pure monotheism, it's Tawheed. Yes. Okay. Can you tell us about that? Like, what do you mean by Islam is pure monotheism? Okay. Uh, well, because if you look into any other religion on earth, I don't care how uh, monotheist they, they claim to be, you're going to find... Um, an element of idolatry. Dead on. There's no question about it. Okay. Um, let's look at, just into the names of religions. Okay. Okay. So Christianity is related to a person. Christ, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We we recognize as Muslims that he's the Christ. Christ is just the uh, translation to Greek of the word Messiah. Messiah. The Greek translated it as Christos. And from Christos in, in the Greek, it became uh, Christus uh, in, in Latin and in Christ in English. Yeah? So, wait, what does it mean in Messiah or Christ? Messiah, the uh, uh, anointed. Anointed means that the, uh, there was this, uh, um, this oil that uh, for some figures, religious figures, they used to put this kind of oil like a sacred or blessed olive oil in the in jerusalem etc so it comes from that and messiah uh so it's related to a person judaism it's related to an area which is judea you know yeah he's also a person uh judah, judah is one of the sons of um of jacob uh yes judea is related to Judah, uh, Yehuda in Arabic, because the twelve sons of uh, Yaqub, Jacob, um, salam, are the twelve tribes. You know, the, the descendants are the twelve tribes, and each tribe settled in a different area uh, in Palestine. Uh, if you talk about Hinduism, it's related to a river, the Hindu river. If you talk about Buddhism, it's related to a person, Buddha. If you talk about any uh, Baha'i, it's related to uh, a guy in the 19th century, Baha'u'llah, who claimed to be, uh, you know, a divine or prophetic figure, etc. You know, if you talk about Ahmadiyya, who claimed to be Muslim, and they're not, you know, are related to a person, you know, Ghulam Ahmad, false uh, Messiah, he claimed to be the Messiah. Each religion is related to a person. A mountain, uh, a river, uh, you know, a tree, uh, a stone, something like that. Islam is not re related to anything like that. Islam is an action. Islam is active. And the action means to submit. To who? To a God who is abstract. He's beyond all trees, all mountains, all people, all he's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent. In order in order to explain this is that uh, Abu Bakr uh, radiallahu anhu said, Kunlu ma khatar bibalik, dhalik. Anything that comes to your mind, you have to know that God is different than, than that thing that you can conceptualize, that you can imagine. Because even imagination works with a composition of actual things even if you imagine a, a unicorn you are making a frankenstein you know a, a composition of different animals he has a horn from this animal uh wings from another animal etc it's an imaginary but it's a composition from actual uh, stuff so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond imagination you cannot imagine god it's beyond the human mind and islam is in part a uh, recognition that you are limited and your mind is limited and God is beyond you. Islam 
in in another sense is uh, also different because it doesn't have an anthropomorphic image of God. Christianity shares with uh, Roman Greek paganism that God became a human being. He has a human shape. Even the father in Christianity, you have him painted in different churches, etc., as a as a bearded guy, you know, either extending his his hand towards the human being, as in the sixth the Sistine Chapel in in the Vatican, or sitting in a throne or something like that. Yeah, in Islam, that's unacceptable because he is beyond the human being. He doesn't have the shape, form of a human being or anything else. So that's one sense in which I mean it takes, uh, uh, you know, Tawheed or uh, monotheism to its utmost consequence. Second thing is, Tawheed uh, entails the concept of Arbudiyah. So, if I am in a relationship with one creator who is the only authentic creator who is worthy of my worship, that worship means that I am, I am subordinated to God. I am under God. I'm not, I'm not equal to God. There's a problem if I think I am God. And some people think that. You know, they don't say it, but they act like like it. They act like it. Uh, can you give us some examples? Yeah, he lives as if he is his own God. Whatever his whims, his wishes, his desires, etc., he acts upon whatever he, he himself uh, desires. And that way of life, and that way of thinking is gonna only push you to subordinate other people to uh, act against the rights of other people and you are gonna end up either in uh, a lot of trouble or in jail or something like that because you're gonna not respect uh, the fact that you're equal to other people and that just it's the, the the golden rule you know don't do to others what you don't like uh, to be done to, to yourself you know that so uh, Islam is based on this on this idea that we are subordinated to God we are equal as human being and we are different just in the level or the degree in which we submit to the will of God and we show consciousness in our life of God taqwa at the end of the day this means one thing which is quite fundamental and at the same time it's very delicate or very subtle which is once I subordinate to God that's the only way to be truly free Ab absolutely free in what sense Islam and the Quran if you read it tells you all the time that you need to go beyond this false pretension that you are completely free and you can do whatever you want, etc. People have this 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 false idea that I am a free human being. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your creator, has loved you and loves you so much that he has given you free will. The creator could have made you completely, uh, you know, uh, like angels. You, you do exactly what you're told and you don't question anything. You have no options, no alternatives, no choices, no free will. But because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you, He gives you the choice. When you love somebody, you make them choose whether to be with you, whether not to be with you. That's actually a manifestation of love towards that, that person. You know? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this choice, this free will, because He loves the human being. And it's a dignification of the human being. It's to create, dignify the human being, giving him this choice. Uh, as وَلَقَدْ حَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ We have dignified, dignity. Bani Adam, the whole human race. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only book that will say, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلِيُؤْمِنِ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلِيَكْفَى Whoever wants to believe, let him do so. When, whoever wants to disbelieve, let him do, do so. But liberty or freedom comes with consequences. Now, the problem with the West especially is that they think that freedom 
is detached from responsibility. You can do whatever you want, and you're not going to pay the bill. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You choose. Do whatever you want. But if you go partying, tomorrow you're going to have a hangover. You can't go partying and expect not to have a hangover. Uh, that's that's applicable to everything in life. Okay, you choose this path. You're going to have to pay the bill. You know, there are some responsibilities and consequences entailed. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran teaches us that there is freedom, but you're not absolutely free. You're not free because at the end of the day, whoever you are, however powerful you are, you are subordinated to the will of Allah, even the oxygen that you breathe. It's not yours. How much did you pay for each breath? You know, it's not yours. These lungs that are pumping all the time, you're not even telling them to, to work. Are you sending messages, telling your heart to, to keep beating? You know, no, it's automatic. No. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this gift of life, this gift of health, etc. And we are in debt. We owe so much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't think you're completely free. Uh, you are within a framework of different uh, laws, the law of gravity, uh, uh, historical laws, soci soci sociological laws, different different laws that govern the universe. But once you accept that you are within those laws and those, uh, you know, frames that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put, then you start playing the game. You know, you can't play chess unless you know the rules of, of the game. So once you know the rules and you know that you are governed by a certain rule, you can't just take a... a a pawn and start like moving him or moving it the way you want you know there are different moves that you have to follow that's the, the game of chess so be intelligent and you know uh, study your your enemy and study the, the move you're going to do next yeah so then when you know you know you are governed by some laws then you start knowing how to to perform your duties to live to to move you know that then you start functioning then you are a completely free human being. Why? Because when you are subordinated to Allah, that frees you automatically. If you are truly subordinated, if you understand Tawheed as the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu understood it to be, when they were sent to the uh, to the um, uh, Emperor of Persia, you know, and they stood before the most powerful emperor in that time. And that companion of the Prophet said, this Prophet, this book, this message was sent to us so that Allah takes us out of the worship of people to the worship of the one creator. Uh, to the worship of the one God. So they understood that Tawheed was freeing them. They were no longer uh, subordinated to another human being. I don't care how powerful he is. If he is pushing me to go against God, then I'm not going to comply. You know? So you're going to be free from the worship of material things. You're going to be free from the worship of your uh, family, of your wife, of your husband, of your... You're, you're not going to worship those people. You're going to treat those people the best you can because you're trying to please the one you worship truly, who's, who's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through treating those people as you should, you are performing that worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's freedom. So that that breaks the, the, the beauty of, about Islam. Look, look, this is very, very profound. You know, we can dig uh, more... Uh, deeper, you know, into this, this concept. One of the basic problems that a human being can have is dependency. Dependency. Depending on, on others? Yes. But depending on others, we depend on others whether we like it or not. We depend on others. You know, we can't live on our own. We're a social being. But dependency, when it becomes 
a psychological and spiritual problem. So, for example, in inter, you know, human relationships, they talk about interdependency. So you cannot live without that person. You cannot move. You cannot function unless that person is is there, is present. So they talk about uh, mother, son, uh, father, daughter. Normally, dependency, other kind of dependency. Some people that uh, lack that kind of warmness in their in their family, etc., develop other types of uh, psychological problems. So they talk about dependency. Tawheed breaks that dependency. Why is alcohol, which is a drug, alcohol is a drug, and one of the most uh, dependency-creating uh, drugs, addictive. addictive. Why is it prohibited in Islam? I'm asking the question. Because it blocks the mind? It blocks the mind. Because it's harmful to the body, because it's harmful to the liver, the heart, the whatever. Yeah, that's one aspect. But there's a deeper aspect, as far as I'm concerned. Drugs and alcohol as one drug. You know, I I I, I emphasize this point and underline the, the concept that alcohol is a drug, because the alcohol industry tries its best to detach or uh, show you alcohol not as a drug when scientifically it's classified as one so in order to keep their sales just like the the tobacco companies you know back in the 60s and 70s tried to show that no tobacco is not harmful it doesn't create uh, this dependency or uh, addictive uh, uh, nature or uh, they talked about how no it doesn't it's not related to cancer they, they, they paid a lot of money in order to falsify so many studies so-called scientific studies in order to keep their sales going the same thing is going now going on now with alcohol so alcohol is a drug why is it prohibited because what you mentioned but there's a deeper meaning here which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want you to depend on something like that doesn't want you to be addicted to anything because addictiveness or addiction is dependency you start worshipping alcohol and some people can reach uh, a level of alcoholism where they can kill or rob or you know uh, break their marriages or anything just to keep that going why? because they worship alcohol they don't call it worship but actually is worship is it has become the center of your life so all your life revolves around that drug. So that it goes against Tawheed. It goes against Tawheed. See, our life, the universe, is based on Tawheed. Based on Tawheed. Based on this idea. Tawheed, not in the sense that we explain it normally, you know, the typical sense that, as far as I'm concerned, can be a little bit shallow sometimes, cannot give the answers that we're looking for here. Yeah? No, Tawheed as the unifying principle of creation. Unifying. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks in the Quran about how diverse the creation is. He talks about that from each uh, animal, each plant, there are pairs. Allah says, yep, pairs. He uh, talks about uh, how diverse the اختلاف, yeah? اختلاف the, the, di- the diversity as the signature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his creation why? everything is diverse is in pairs because the only one who's the one and only is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's the singularity of Allah he's the one the rest come in pairs and come in uh, numbers Allah is the one yeah. So, uh, Tawheed, uh, for me, explains so many different things uh, ontho- ontologically, you know, in the sense how we define uh, uh, things in our life. Yeah. So, that, that example of alcohol or any other dependency or, um, you know, uh, addiction, yeah, addiction can come in so many different forms. You know, there's sexual addiction, 
today is a problem in the in the West. It's causing problems. And, you know, with pornography, with all that we witness now, you know, consuming the whole world. Why are there so many divorces? With all the families and the children that suffer because of that, because you know, we are depending on others and other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, uh, when it comes to material dependency, people, if they lack uh, material resources, their life comes crumbling down. They, they lose focus. They completely uh, are destroyed because because they're going through some hard times economically. Okay, so who cares? As long as you have enough to live your day, you're the king of the world. This is the Prophet Sassam speaking. Men uh, The ones who spend the day secure in their family, in their uh, entourage, in their environment, they're secure. You're not, your life is not threatened. You have food on the table for your day. Enough food for his day. And uh, health in his body, your health, your uh, yeah, healthy in your body. Then you own the whole universe. You know, فقد فقد حيزت له الدنيا. The whole universe is yours. So this hadith, one one teaching out of thousands of teaching, is enough to feel tranquility in my heart. You know, whatever happens, I'm in good hands, no problem. Uh, I have water. That's the I take water for granted. You know what happened in order to for me to have this water on the table? You know, uh, the oceans had to react. The the clouds ha had to bring me that water. It had to come down. How it was channel channeled and how it to reach my table or for me to say Bismillah and drink one cold sip of water. Is, yeah, sit. So this brings me to with your with your. Permission to one thing: a Muslim, a Muslim, Muslim, in, not in the sense of Muslim against Christian, Muslim against. Uh, this is not an attempt to put people against each other. Muslim is not a label. If we believe Islam or Muslim to be a label, we're wrong. Muslim is a way of understanding uh, reality. So the Muslim is in a constant state of wonder. Everything draws his attention. You know, he sees, uh, you know, any happening in nature, any happening in social relationship, etc., is a sign for him to reflect. So we, the problem is that with heedlessness and unconsciousness of ghafla, the ghafla, ghafla is a Quranic concept, is a state in which we fall. A state of decidia, of uh, heedlessness, of, you know, unconsciousness. We live automatically uh, like we're distracted. Yeah, like we're asleep. Mm. We're asleep. We're sleepwalking. You know, sleepwalking. The other state where we should be is zikr. So you have rafla and you have zikr. Zikr is that you are alert. You are in a state of um, mindfulness. Now they have coined this term, mindfulness. You know, like they have come up with something new. The zikr is our food, spiritual food. We have been doing zikr for millennia. You know, that's our daily basis, you know. For us, zikr is like bread or rice here, you know. So zikr is... the uh, reminding yourself that you are not alone there there is a cre creator and you um you are in a state of wonder anything in your mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is a state almost exclusive where a Muslim lives so my challenge is to regain that state of wonder not take things for granted if you take things for granted, you're not going to be grateful. You're not going to appreciate what you have. You're going to be focused on what you don't have. People now look 
at what they don't have. I want to buy this. I want to uh, be like that guy, you know, a copy of someone else. I want to, you don't appreciate what you are, what you have. That's the problem we have. In a state of zikr, in a state of mindfulness, you appreciate appreciate what you have been given, what you are, where Allah has taken you so far. And that sows in your soul the seeds of trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one, the, the one that has brought me so far is going to be with me the rest of the way. Just like I didn't come all the way here on my own. You know, don't worry. Calm down. Yeah, that's that's uh, what Islam gives me. Islam is not just a label or uh, I am a Muslim because I'm not so and so, etc. Islam is a state in which I exist. A state which gives me a happiness beyond words. Words cannot put that happiness. Uh, Umar ibn Khattab عن, told the Sahaba, he said to them, I swear by God that if the kings of the world, the emperors, know what you have, they would come fighting for it with their swords. Why? Because it's a happiness, it's a fulfillment that you feel in the deepest core of your soul. That, you know, if, if we had gold and we had, uh, you know, uh, you know, oil today, if they find oil in, or they find gas in Gaza, you know what's happening in Gaza today, a genocide. Or oil in, in Iraq, they go there, the U.S., uh, Russia, etc., China, they rush because they found some wealth. But there is there is a kind of wealth that we have that if they knew where it is, they would have come in, you know, fighting for it with their weapons. But it's unreachable. It's something hidden in the, in the, in the heart of, of a Muslim, you know, which is this state of zikr with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mindfulness. You know, whether you are uh, in good times, bad times, uh, times of plenty, times of s- scarce uh, resources, then that. this gives you a sense of equanimity. Uh, equanimity is when you reach uh, a place where whatever happens, it doesn't change the state you are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are the nafsul mutma'inna. You know, the soul that has reached a level of such battles that it doesn't care about what happens. You know, I can be given, taken, it doesn't make any difference. You know, I have something else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The rest doesn't count. You know, you start seeing things in their real proportion. So Islam teaches you to see to see things as they are, not not as they seem to be. You know, you need to put things in their real proportion, and that teaches you to have priorities in life. If you ma qadr Allah, they haven't given Allah His right value. If you give Allah His value, which is infinite, then the rest will be eclipsed. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing uh, is worth it, anything anymore. And everything is worth a lot because through those things you know Allah and you reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through your family, your children and education, etc., you serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the end of the day, you know that there's only tools. Everything that you have been given are not the goal in themselves. They are the path through which you can reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. Your kids, my, I have kids. I have kids, and I love them. But I know that Allah is more precious than my kids. That Allah has put those kids in my life to test me, whether I convert those kids into my goal in life, or I convert them, or I, I consider them a path through which I can serve Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, teach them good evil, educate them, etc. And that's how I reach the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you start seeing things from a, a completely different angle. And I've been told this by so many Muslims, new Muslims, 
that they say this has completely put my my perspectives upside down you know? uh, and that's why Islam is false and there's a an industry of Islamophobia an industry of fear towards Islam etc there's an industry and there are think, think tanks in so many different places in the world which study just new ways new trends to draw people away from Islam I know this for a fact why? because it's not good for business what I'm talking about here uh, they want you to be completely attached to material things and they want you to be constantly looking for what you don't have instead of appreciating being grateful for what you have why because they want to sell uh, consumerism is based on consumption if you if you don't consume then the market is going to suffer so this is the mentality of the market so we're talking about different mentality mentality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relationship of uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a different mentality than the mentality of banks, markets, you know, uh, shares, upside down. That's a different mentality. That's a different different mentality that serves only material stuff. Money, 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 money. You know, that's the God, the new God. Just like the the Israelites after Moses went to the Sinai mountain, you know, when he went to the mountain to receive the Torah, they started worshiping worshiping Actually, you know, this uh, gold, uh, this golden calf, mm -hmm. they, they, this golden calf, they, they call it, they built it, they, they, uh, they made it by melting their the gold they had brought with them from from Egypt, etc., and they started worshiping it. Yep, yeah? mm -hmm. and it's told that this guy uh, who's a Samiri. Uh, built it in such a way that when the wind would blow, the calf would have this sound like it was alive, like it. So when Moses came, he found that they were worshipping the, the calf. And aren't you the ones that just followed me from Egypt and I just saved you from the Pharaoh? You know? Why is Moses the most mentioned prophet and messenger in the Quran more than any other prophet? The most uh, frequently mentioned uh, prophet messenger in the Quran is Moses. Yeah, but why is that? why is that? Because the paradigm, the model of prophetic, I guess, I guess, phar pharaonic or uh, pharaoh-like figures, is still standing until the end of of time. The struggle between what is prophetic mm -hmm. and what is pharaoh like the pharaoni there is like a struggle between good and evil yeah but, but between this mentality that sees only the material pharaoh saw that they had so much wealth you know he had built all these castles so he said al I am your supreme lord you have to worship me you know like the worshiping ego, as exactly so the West now they said, "Well, we we reached the moon. We have all this wealth. So, you know, we can destroy a country in a matter of days or week weeks. Uh, we can do this. We can do that. You know, like the the one that entered the debates with Ibrahim, Ali Salam, Abraham, peace be upon him. Can you can you show? Yeah, Ibrahim Ali Salam said, uh, Rabbi." Your he, uh, a way you meet, uh, my 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 lord, uh, gives lives, gives life, and gives death. You know, the one that decides who's gonna be alive, who's not, is Allah, your creator, for good reason, his his wisdom. The guy, the world, yeah, the world, said, and it he what means I give life and death. So he brought two people. He killed one, and he, you know, like. A, set one free and he said I killed this one and I gave life to that one so he told him my lord brings the son 
from the from the east you bring it from the west and the one that disbelieved in Allah you know was completely um, refuted so the same thing they were worshipping this golden calf and he started uh, uh, talking to his brother how come you know I left you alone with, the, with them etc he said so uh, today if you go to Wall Street there is a, a golden calf in Wall Street you know the the, the pole of Wall Street I don't know there's, there's a symbol on Wall Street there's a statue outside the buildings of Wall Street etc which is uh, a a bull uh, which is uh, golden in, in color uh, so I see the similarity subhanallah and the dollar has this uh, this pyramid with the one eyed pyramid the dollar you know and the pyramid is a symbol of the pharaoh, pharaoh you know so today we have still this struggle between a prophetic message that wants to set people free truly to set you free uh, to connect you with the divine with your creator beyond human beings beyond any control by other people by ideologies by you know and you have another uh, model that wants you to be a slave a consumer you have this code you are just a consumer a taxpayer and you have nothing else you are here to just produce consume produce consume that's it and that's not life that's not what life is about as far as I'm concerned and as far as the prophetic message is concerned and it's inevitable that you are going to have a clash between these two models you know do we do we see a clash no well yes you see a clash uh, look at Gaza there's a huge clash in Gaza in Gaza you have people that are free truly free in Gaza they have nothing what do they have they don't have even running water they don't have even bread on their table they have to walk tens of kilometers in order to just have a a bag of flour they have absolutely nothing they're dying out of hunger why because the pharaoh said so the pharaoh is killing them the pharaoh is saying i am going to decide who's going to live who's going to die i'm going same model we are just not capable of reading between the lines it's the same thing happening and who's free the pharaoh is the slave is the slave of his ego he's the slave of his his false pretension he's the slave of his uh, fullness he has been fooled by the weapons the wealth the bank accounts all that he said okay uh, now I can do whatever I want he's he's a slave the free ones are the ones that in spite of being bombed the bombs are coming down like rain on their on their heads Instead of that, they're still saying, Allahu Akbar, uh, God is greater than you. God is greater. Yeah, Those are free people. They're going to die free. I'd rather live and die as a free man than live and die as a slave. A slave to whatever whatever else there is except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then like, at the end of the day, all of us are going to die. You choose. <laughs> you're a slave to death in, in a sense you know that's inevitable yeah. uh, you know uh, life is a finite thing and the sight of a person when he's leaving life is quite a, a thing you know if you if you have witnessed uh, the moment a person is about to die it's just a, a weird moment one second ago he was breathing now he's not no it's, it's a very very powerful sight you know I lost my father just a few months ago I, uh, that's a lie and he was right in my lap you know? um, I was trying to teach him shahada as a trying his last moments it's probably like he lived all his life as Muslim as a muhid yeah. 
So, but you know, you start thinking how, oh, he was born in the 40s. You know, from the 40s until now, you know, how many decades, how many experiences, how many. So, you know, countries appeared, other ones disappeared, you know, in, in his lifetime. So, so much happened. You know? You know, so much technology, the, the man reached the, the moon, you know, the, in the 60s, he witnessed that. So much happened. And at the end of the day, he looks back. I know for sure every dying human being looks back and he said, my goodness, what a small slot of window of time that I have been given. You know, so short. H how long are you going to live? 60 years, 70 years, 100 years? You name it. I I'll write you a check right now. 120 years, 150. Okay, 150. There you go. When you die after 150 years, you're going to look back. And it's going to look like a dream. You just dream to our moments and you're waking up. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh said, People are asleep. When they die, they wake up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this. Says, we will take your we your hijab, your veil. فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ Hadith and your uh, your vision today in the day of judgment will be piercing. Hadith like it like a sword. No, you're going to see things as they are. So our our uh, subhanallah, our challenge in this life is to die before we die. To kill the ego before it's going to be killed anyway. Once the person dies, the soul and the body are separated and that's the ego the, the union between the soul and the body that's what we call nafs ego so this bodily experience is the one that has created this pretension in us this uh, this uh, false vision that we are separate you know we are separate we're not separate what separates you from the world is not your skin the skin is not the frontier between you and the world because just like you are connected to your body to your heart sorry every human being can put his right hand on his heart and feel the heart pumping yeah blood to the so you are connected to your heart yes in the same manner you're connected to the sun how is it how because the heart is pumping blood to your body and you still stay alive the sun is pumping light and warmth to the universe and to your body imagine you yourself without the sun you're not going to be alive you're not going to exist so your existence depends on the existence of your heart just like it depends on the existence of the sun so it's not it's not a matter of what's inside you or what's outside you you're connected to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you are subordinated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in so many different ways in every way you can imagine and that is a very important philosophical point here which is the contingency of the human being the human being is contingent in in the sense that our existence depends on the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of the attributes of the creator is al-hayat he's alive the life but his life is not our life He's the source of life. Any life depends on him. Any existence depends on, on him. One of the the, the uh, attributes of Allah is al wujud Existence. So in order for us to exist, we depend on him existing. Without him, we, we cease to exist automatically. You know, the al-qayyumiyya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. al al-qayyu. The living, the sustainer. Because he's living, he sustains creation. So, for example, in some uh, religions that think or believe that God dies, you know, the question is, if God dies, who's sustaining everything? Everything is still running. Nothing has changed. You know? So, who's, who's, uh, who's doing the job? <laughs> so, that kind of... Uh, ayat al-Kursi, which is the most important ayat in the Quran, is... A reply, a recitation 
to these kind of uh, false uh, ideas about God. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah, la ilaha illahu, Allah, there's no God except Him, al shayyu qayyu, the living, the sustainer. Uh, yeah, that's a reply as well. Well, I know. Uh, no sleep or slumber affects him. Why? Because in some religions as well, they told us that Allah, God, has to rest after six days of creation. He has to rest. The, the word days in the Quran doesn't mean days 24 hours. Day, yawm in Arabic, means a period of time. It can be a thousand years, it can be a million years. So days means the translations of the Quran I are quite bad. I don't know about English, but I'm not I'm not very familiar with translation. <laughs> it is bad. The last translation I read was in two thousand, you know, twenty four years ago. It was by this old old translation by by a, a Muslim, one of the first Muslim uh, British Muslims called uh, Marmaduke Pixel. Uh, it was was all right, but there are some things that are debatable. In Spanish, we have some translations that are quite bad. Okay, so they translate Allah has created the, the, the universe, the heavens and the earth in six days. So a reader in Spanish is going to say, "Days? What do you mean days? You know, before the creation of the universe, there were no days. Be, before the creation of." The, the the earth and the sun what what are you talking about days the days of the earth the days of mars the days of jupiter they're different you know different hours different it doesn't mean like that it doesn't it doesn't mean that it means in, in six different uh periods six different epochs if you if you see the typical uh, drawing of the big bang and expansion of the universe which looks like a, a trumpet, you know. There's a drawing, very, very famous drawing of how the yeah, exactly like a trumpet, like this. It is divided by lines in in different epochs, so six different periods, you know. So the Planck period, etc., etc., so condensed, and this is insanely accurate in the Quran, amazingly accurate. The Quran talks about the Big Bang. The, the Big Bang in Surah Al-Anbiya, uh, chapter 20, 21. Uh, ha- have the disbelievers not seen that the heavens and the earth were together and we have split it, split them asunder. You know, it says something like this in English. Huh? In the same chapter at the end, talks about the Big Crunch, which is a very, very plausible theory in astrophysics and uh, cosmology nowadays, which is just like the the universe exploded and is um, it's uh, uh, like expanding. It's going to shrink and collapse on itself. That's at the end of the same chapter. You know, it says, يَوْمَ نَطْوِي السَّمَاءَ كَطَيِّ سِدِينِ لِكُتُبَ أَوْ لِلْكِتَابِ uh, the day we are going to wrap everything, uh, the, 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 the heaven, just like the scrolls are, are being wrapped. You know, the scroll, the book, you know, the scroll of a manuscript. You, you, uh, you open it, you read it, and then you roll it. And that's how the heaven is going to collapse on itself. The expansion of the universe, it was... Uh, discovered in, I think, in 1920-something, 24 or something, by Edwin Hubble. That's why the the telescope is called Hubble, because he saw that the stars were, and the, especially the, the galaxies, were distancing from one another. You know, the, the distances were increasing. So he didn't believe himself. He, he tried to, to calculate it once and, and twice, etc. And he came to a conclusion he he tried to avoid because he wanted to guess his his convictions that the universe was expanding. Huh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the heavens we have built means with 
force, with total control, and we are expanding it. So the universe is expanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about some periods of that expansion. Surat, I think, Surat al-Duhan or something like that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and it was like a, a, a smoke. They talk about the first period, one of the first periods of the universe, which is the nebula. Neb, nebula comes from a cloud in, in, in Latin. It means cloud. And that's an inaccurate word when it comes to science. Because a cloud condenses because of coldness. The water condenses into a cloud because of, uh, you, you know, uh, a decrease in the, the temperature of the water. The nebula were like that, suspended uh, matter with gases, etc. Why? Because of the heat. So, Duhan is smoke, and smoke is connected to the heat. So, the Quranic description, or the word used by the Quran, is more accurate than the word used by science up until today. Because it has a connotation of coolness in science, when in the Quran it has a connotation of heat. And very high temperatures were reached in, the, in those formations. That when they started to cool down, the, the, the planets and the stars started to form, you know, the condensation or uh, of, of that mass. So the Quran, you, you name it, it talks about these unbelievably recent discoveries by the human being was the, discovered yesterday. People that used to live with this. Edwin Hubble are still alive today, you know. <laughs> they're very old, but they're still alive. That's yesterday. The Quran talks about it 1,400 years ago. How come? Oh, it's just a coincidence. Okay, you're free to believe that if you, if you wish so. I believe otherwise. It's too many co co yeah, coincidences. It's not one, two, three, you know, too many. If we go to the Hadith of the Prophet, you name it, you know, hundreds of things. So that shows that the source of this information is not human. It's the creator. The one that knows the creation better than, than ourselves. The one that gave this uh, this information to the Prophet them through the Wahi, through the revelation, both the Quran and the Sunnah, the uh, teachings of the Prophet Prophet yeah. yeah, so like we, we spoke about ego in a bit. And yet we said people who worship their ego, who worship themselves. Right. So is it that all what is required for a person who is searching for the truth is to put his ego aside, humble himself, and truly ask for guidance. Absolutely. I think that's that's the door. Um, you cannot come to God with arrogance. You know, it, the key to the door is humbleness and to know your place before God. Now, uh, a lot of people think they're religious. And I'm talking about any kind of religion, including Muslims. But if you have, that's why the Prophet ﷺ says, if you have an atom of arrogance in your heart, then you're in trouble. You you have an impediment to enter Jannah. That's the key. Yeah. The key is humbleness. And that's a practice in Islam that I wish that Muslims understood. When we bow down 70, no, 34 times a day, because you have 17 rakahs, yeah, multiplied by two, because in each rakah you have two sajdas, yeah, two, two postrations. So if 17 is time two, that's 34. 34 times that you put your forehead on the floor and you say, Subhanar bi ala, glorified be my Lord, the most high. What does that mean? What does that prostration mean? It means that we are completely in depth with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we put the most noble part of our face, the one I look you in, in the face, recognize you, your forehead, your face, you put it, and it disappears. It's against the floor. Your ego. Ego comes from Latin. Ego means I. Ego in Latin is I. It's the first pronoun. 
the first person pronoun. Ego in Latin is I. So the I is gone. Anna is gone. It's, uh, disappears. I am absolutely nothing. Nobody. Who am I? Am I the, the guy I see in the in the mirror? That guy is completely different from the guy I saw 10 years ago. It changed completely. Physically, the features. And if I see myself in 40 years, I'm not going to recognize myself. You know, huge changes. So you are not your face. You are not your body. The body, let's talk scientifically about the body. You know that in every minute, Millions of cells die. And millions of cells are born. So there is a flow of dead cells that we are shedding and new cells that are produced by the body. So what you see as a body is not constant. It's like, look, you know a whirlpool. Whirlpool in the, in, a, in, a, in a river. You know, this the whirlpool. Whirlpool. Okay. That is formed, you see a worm pool and you see a shape, but the water is not the same. The worm pool is there, the shape of a worm pool. But there's more water coming in, or water leaving the worm pool. So you are a shape, but the content of that shape is completely new every day. There's a world's going on, a revolution going on inside our body, but we're not conscious of it. Alhamdulillah that we're not. If we were conscious, we wouldn't sleep at night. Rahman. This is the, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine that we would remember our birth, how we were delivered into the years. We wouldn't be able to live. It's so traumatic so traumatic to see a child being born you cannot believe it you know the head of, of that baby is squished like a, a piece of bread yeah yeah it's it's uh it's flat and then he or she is born the head recuperates its shape oh yeah 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 completely look it up the the the, the head is completely flat coming out of this womb. And we have gone through that. You know? We have gone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it in the Quran. Oh no, don't talk about this, you know. No, it's natural. It's something that happened to every human being. Allah mentions it. Hmm? We, have, we have facilitated you know, the cranium skull of a, of a baby is not completely formed you have different uh, plaques that are not joined together they're joined after a year or so in order to make it easy for the head to, to be flattened if not it's going to break so you have five I think or something five different pieces that later are joined together that's why the head of the, the of the baby is a bit soft yet. That has a meaning. That has a functionality. So going back to to our topic, you know, we don't remember that because we couldn't be able to live if you remember that traumatic experience we went through. That's a, a mercy for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that He made us forget that. So. Forgetfulness is also a type of mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put into human beings. So if everything, anywhere you look, anywhere you look, there's something calling you. Sometimes you can you can see, sometimes you can't. It's not the same thing, the verb to look and the verb to see. How is it? Oh, you can be looking at something, but you can't see what's happening there. Okay. So for example, we can be both can contemplate and looking at the same thing and you see one thing and I see something completely different. So seeing is not the same as looking. So we look at, for example, uh, uh, an animal. 
um, person that is just looking is going to see a cow, you know, grazing or something. The person who is seeing something is going to maybe connect it with something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. A glass of milk. You look at a glass of milk, you're going to see something. I'm going to see something completely different. I'm going to reflect about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that he gave gave us milk out of damin wa farth. A dam is blood. Farth is... Uh, you know, uh, the the digested uh, food in the stomach of a, of a cow. So digested food is waste. Yeah. But the blood, so two things that seem to be completely impure. Blood and uh, waste. And from two, those two things, he gave you the the symbol of pureness, which is milk. <laughs> it's so light. It's so amazing. Why does he mention it, for example, in the Surah Al-Nahl, chapter 16, the chapter, chapter of bees? One of the most beautiful chapters in the Quran. I, I wish people could open just that chapter and read how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one after another, is enumerating so many different happenings going on, things that are going on, that you don't stop and, and think about them until he reaches the bees. And people don't understand why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about bees. Bees are the most productive animals on earth. If bees disappear, the human bees would cease to exist. Because 90% of the fruits and vegetables that we consume come from the bees. The, the food that animals consume come from bees. Because bees, you know, the tilqiyah, you know, they pollinate the, the bees plants. The bees. But why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the bees and he says, yeah. Allah has inspired the bees, has revealed to the bee how to navigate its paths, you know, in the mountains, how to seek different, you know, homes for herself uh, uh, in order to produce honey, etc., in uh, trees, etc., and artificial. Um, why I see there an indications, the indication to the, 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 the believer we should be like bees in the sense that just like a bee and I have a ground to base this on the bee chooses very well where to to um, to eat you know, different flowers, different, so the food is chosen very carefully. And that food is turned into this beverage, sharab, uh, this beverage that is shifa, it is a, a cure, cleanness to humanity. So as human beings, we should uh, kit, like feed on the Quran, the Sunnah, the the uh, teachings of of knowledgeable people, etc. And all that knowledge shouldn't be just knowledge; it needs to be digested and turned into this beverage that will be a cureness to to mankind. Why do I say this? Because the Prophet Sallallahu says so in Hadith. We need to to understand these passages based on the Sunnah as well, of course. The, the teachings of the Prophet Sassim explain the Quran in so many different ways. So he says that the believer is like it, a bee. Huh? He doesn't fall. The bee will not uh, like sit except on something pure. A flower. Yeah? Uh, and doesn't eat except the pure and doesn't come out of her except pure stuff so the believer he looks for the the right place to be and the right people to be with 
and the right stuff to consume, not just physically, we consume halal and tayyibah, but also intellectually, spiritually, etc. Your food needs to be carefully selected. And that comes out as something something tayyib, he says, the Prophet This is the, he, he gives these examples, the mu'min of the believer. And in the hadith, and the example of the disbeliever is like a, a, a fly. Uh, the fly sits on impure stuff, eats impure stuff, and what comes out of the fly is just disease, you know, impure stuff. So we need to be a bee. Uh? So, and that brings me to what Muhammad Ali used to say. He used to say, yeah, uh, they dance, dance like a butterfly, sting like a bee. <laughs> it's amazing how different. Uh, mosquitoes. I've never thought about this. Yeah, that's fine. But it's like two different words. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the Quran is very, very accurate. You know, it talks about bees and it talks about uh, uh, flies. Uh, that's a mosquito. And then the fly, when he says, uh, uh, and if the, the, the fly takes something from them, they will not be uh, capable of uh, regaining it. Both are weak. Both the ones trying to regain it and the ones uh, they're trying to regain it from. Bees and human beings, bo- both of them are weak. In the sense that the uh, example of the Quran is talking about idolatry. When we worship a human being, an idol or a tree or whatever, you're trying to gain something from a human being from a tree from a stone from and you're you're not going to get anything both of you are weak and the only one that can uh benefit you or harm you is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so people that are stuck in that predicament of worshiping others than God the basic question does he harm you does he benefit you no so why worship him the only one enough yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that benefits you, the one that harms you, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the only will you're sub, subject to is the will of Allah. So why worship others? Jesus, be, be, peace be upon him. He prostrates, he puts his poor head on the floor three times. Matthew 26, 39. I'm not coming up with stuff. He puts his, floor, his, his head on the floor. It says it. He puts his forehand on the floor three times and what did he say he says father which means lord it's a bad translation from uh hebrew and aramaic because he sp- spoke aramaic to greek and latin bad translation lord no uh, um make this cup pass from me the cup of death he knew they were coming to kill him if he came here to die for my sins why at the last moment he would ask allah to save him you know, that doesn't make sense. And then he says, but be it your will and not mine. So the Trinity, they say, no, he's, he has the same will, the same knowledge, the same power as the Father, as the Holy Spirit. That's wrong. The Bible says otherwise. Be it your will and, and not mine. That's Islam. Your will is subordinated to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's Islam. He said, peace be upon him, uh, Jesus. Literally, in the, in, in the New Testament, he was asked, who enters pa- paradise? He said, nobody will enter paradise unless he is mashlama. It is mashlama. In, in Aramaic, which means Muslim. Mashlama is the same word as Muslim, because aslama is the, the verb you find in Aramaic. The, the sing, the, the sound S in Arabic is sh, just like in Hebrew, salam becomes shalom. Yeah, so mushlama is Muslim. They went and they translated it into Latin and then into different versions of English. You know how nobody uh, enters paradise unless he's perfect. What does that have to be to do with Muslims? And are we supposed to be perfect? You know, uh, Nietzsche, you know, the, the huge. Uh, German philosopher um, Friedrich Nietzsche in one of his books 
please read this book. It's called The Antichrist. Okay? I think in page 60, 60 something. So that you don't, you know, <laughs> uh, think I'm asking you to waste time. No, go to those pages. We know Nietzsche for one of his quotes, which is, God has died. But we don't finish what he said afterward. And you have killed him, he said. God has died, and you have killed him. And he explains what he means. He said, God has died, you have killed him. Why? Because you have uh, converted the message of Jesus, etc., in something that doesn't even make sense. He's against the church, against this uh, false uh, form of Christianity, which another huge philosopher who's the Danish philosopher uh, Soren Kierkegaard Soren Kierkegaard this guy had two terms he talks about Christianity and Christians, Christianism yeah? he talks about Christianity as the teachings of Jesus as he taught them yeah? and Christianism is how they became after some time. So he, he draws a very clear line about what Jesus taught and what we think he taught, you know, according to the church, etc. So we know Nietzsche through that quote. But go to other books. Read all his books altogether. And you'll find Nietzsche talking about Islam in the most precious terms. He says, uh, pretty much the best religion ever there is is religion that is Islam. He says, you know, he he's very very aggressive there. You know, he says he says the church fought against something before which it should have bowed down. He says that. Who and what is that? Islam. You know, and they fought it because they couldn't understand it. He says, literally, I wish, in other terms, but this is the message, I wish the Muslims didn't stop in, in Spain and they reached us in in um, in Germany. I wish we would, were Muslims instead of a Christian. Now, these are not my words. They're the words of one of the most influential, one of the pillars of, of atheism, they consider them the, the pillars of atheism, etc. Uh, and he talks, in, we're talking about three, four pages where he, it's like a, an ode to Islam. It's uh, a homage to Islam. Yeah. We, we are never introduced to those words. God has died. That's all he said. Well, you need to read his books and see what he said. Go to the Antichrist. You you find him talking in such beautiful terms about Islam. So uh, uh, we are fed this false narrative about is a religion, about Islam in particular, about history. We are fed such narrow uh, narratives about history. There's a huge chunk of history that's forgotten. And I, as a guy that comes from Spain, <laughs> you know, Al Andalus in Spain, I can talk until tomorrow morning about the huge chunk, a, a thousand years of European Western civil, civilization that's completely thrown out. Why? Not because it didn't produce anything, it was one of the most productive periods of human history. But it's Chucked away, why? Because they were Muslims, they were not Christians. Now, if they talk about uh, the most important minds of humanity, the most important thinkers and, you know, philosophers, the list, Google it. The list is going to be filled just with Greek, Latin, or European thinkers. What about China? What about the Muslim world? What about so many places on earth? Those, okay. those people couldn't, 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 couldn't think, yeah? They didn't have a language to, to talk, uh, etc. So that is a very ethnocentric 
uh, vision of the world. Uh, the Europeans yeah. created this false narratives uh, that we are the center of the earth. Humanity is just revolving around us. And humanity should be in our image. Dress like me, eat like me, live like me, etc. And that is destroying uh, the diversity on, on earth. Just Not just the gastronomic diversity, the uh, ethnographic diversity, the diversity in every sense, intellectual diversity, destroying diversity in spiritual terms, in so many terms. Why? Because they want to make the whole earth live, uh, eat, uh, uh, even live and die in the way dictated by the uh, the European civilization. That's, that's not going to um, take us anywhere um, anywhere uh, really. so like uh, it's said that Islam started 1400 or 1500 years ago yeah. is that true? no yeah. yes both are, are correct um, Islam has two meanings I could say it has three to be honest so the first I'm going to say it has four meanings First meaning, Islam as the message brought to us, preached by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah, that's the most commonly known meaning. Yeah. However, within Islam, there is a component called Islam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the very famous, it's a foundational hadith. Uh, one on which Islam is built, the Hadith of Jibril, Gabriel, peace be upon him. Hadith down Islam, Hadith down Ima, Hadith down and and Ihsan, Hadith down Sa. You know, talk to me, uh, te- uh, teach me about Islam. What is Islam? He t- tells him the five pillars of Islam: Shahada, prayer, uh, fasting, uh, and zakat, and pilgrimage. Talk to me about Iman, faith. What's faith? Is believing in Allah was belief. Believing in Allah, His uh, angels, His books, His prophets, the day of judgments, and the predestination, the qada'ul qada'. Okay, khayrihi wa sharihi, both the good and evil that it, it entails. Teach, talk to me about Ihsan, to worship Allah as if you were seeing Him, because if you don't see Him, He does see you. And teach me, talk to me about. The sa'a. The one being asked doesn't know more than one asking. Okay, tell me, uh, it's uh, you know, uh, it's uh, it's uh, signs. He says, that the uh, servant gives birth to its uh, her uh, like uh, How do you say that? Uh, Ma- uh, mistress uh, like the mother gives birth to the mistress the, a lot of scholars say, say that uh, this talks about at the end of the world or towards the end of the world children are going to exert this control over parents that they're going to start being dictating you know oh, so, so, so the parents is going to be the mates is that yeah, yeah the maid gives birth to the mistress and the second one, which is very interesting, visible, he says, and the fact that you see um, shepherds who once were uh, uh, like uh, badly dressed and they didn't have even shoes, etc., you know, like very poor people that lived in the desert, they are going to start competing in building tall buildings yeah and that's quite visible now the, the tallest buildings on earth are in Dubai and other countries where uh, maybe a hundred years ago you know they lived from desert yeah at the desert and they were shepherds and they had the, the camels and stuff like that yeah so that establishes that Islam is one of the components Islam is the practice is the outward uh, practice of Islam, of Islam is the practice of Islam called Islam, but it has another component which is 
a, a belief component, which is called Iman. And there is an all-encompassing component, which is Ihsan, the state in which I live, in consciousness. Uh, to live as if you were looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if you don't see him he does see the company of Allah in your life so that's another component so that's the second meaning of Islam as a component of Islam you know the, the Islam within Islam yep the third component is or arises from the fact that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is not the founder of Islam he is the last prophet of Islam all prophets, all messengers taught Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran he talks about Moses, uh, Jesus, he talks about uh, Abraham, so he mentioned he mentions them as Muslimin. Why not Muslim? I am the first of Muslims, the first of the ones that submitted, submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So each prophet is the first one among the community. The first submitter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have different prophets and messengers preaching the same, absolutely same message, which is Islam. And that's the meaning of the ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ إِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ The one who seeks any other deen, any other way of life, which is not Islam, Will, will not be accepted from him. What about the, the followers of Jesus, of Moses, of Abraham? If we understand Islam just from that narrow point of view, just as the followers of Muhammad Wasallam, what about the other ones? They're not going to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that global Islam, universal Islam, that unifies all the family of prophets and messengers. Yeah. That's the Islam we're talking about there. This fourth concept of Islam is an Islam that goes not just beyond Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, beyond this Ummah, this community, which is the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not just uh, two other prophets and, and human beings that lived uh, in other periods of time. It goes, it goes beyond the human being in the sense that all creation is in the state of Islam. So the sun, the moon, the ants, the bees that we mentioned, you know, the the galaxies, the atoms that can com, you know compose uh, or constitute our bodies. Every atom has is in the state of Islam. And Subhanallah, if you go to the macro perspective and the micro perspective, you're going to see some. Amazing stuff. Uh, I was approached by this guy. I think he was still not a Muslim. I think that later he became a Muslim. He told me, why seven rounds that you go, you know, around the, the Kaaba? Why seven times? And why anti-clockwise? You know? And that is the same sense, anti-clockwise, that we see in galaxies. Anti-clockwise. And that we see in uh, the atom. In the atom, subatomic components, which are especially the electrons, go around the, the nucleus anti-clockwise. The atoms have different ele electrons depending on the number of electrons they have. Yeah? So, you can have uh, hundreds of electrons there, you know, 200 or more electrons. Maybe the most heavy uh, uh, atom has 250 something electrons. I'm not sure, I'm not a physicist. Or, uh, but those electrons are always going to be structured and uh, going around the nucleus in seven orbits. Never more than seven orbits. You have one, two, three, four, five. Six or the maximum is seven orbits, no matter how many electrons you have revolving around anti-clockwise. Sorry, I did like this. It's anti-clockwise around the nucleus. Seven orbits. Yeah, so that's what happens. No, any number has to be within seven orbits as a maximum. There's no other number. Mm. And that's consistent. Any atom 
has seven orbits. Any any element has seven orbits of electrons. Yeah. When I studied this, you know, when I was studying physics, etc., I was I was astonished. What? You know, and the movement is anti-clockwise seven. The number seven. Why? It's the, the signature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the number, the, what do you call it? The golden number. Uh, the Fibonacci number. There's a number that uh, so many shapes from the, the 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 galaxies to some shapes in vegetables to the shapes in uh, the human eye to the shape in the body. They, uh, they have the same proportion, which is the Fibonacci number. Oh, look it up. Yeah, the golden number. So how come it's consistent? The same proportion, the same number anywhere you look. That's unity. It means the one that created the human being is the one that created the, the galaxy, etc. You have mathematics. Somebody said that mathematics is the language of, of, of the creator. In some sense, it's true because through numbers, you see that something is consistent here. That this is unified by the same rules, subhanAllah. So, uh, we need to be able to read you know, Iqra, you know, that was revealed in this month of Ramadan. It's not just Iqra in the sense of to read the book. Of course, initially, and uh, the original meaning is read the book. The Iqra is read around you. Read. Uh, read the meaning. Today, we have a crisis. A crisis. A global crisis. It's not the crisis of food. Because when it comes to food, today the pandemic that we're suffering around the world is not hunger. It's not famine. It's uh, uh, obesity. Okay. Obesity. Uh, overweight. That's the, the pandemic we have. Uh, in the 80s, 70s, etc., we were talking about world hunger, etc. Now we have obesity. Too much food. It's ba badly and poorly distributed, maybe, but we have food to feed us for I don't know how many years, yeah? So it's not the crisis of food. It's not the crisis of money because you have super wealth going on on Earth. You have fortunes that if divided by the, the population of, you know, of Malaysia would make everybody be well off. Yeah? So it's not, it's not the crisis of resources. You know, because new technologies are developing, you know, the oil problem is sooner or later going to be transcended, transcended and, you know, it's not resources. The crisis we're suffering is the crisis of meaning. Meaning. People no longer know the meaning of their life, of their existence. So it's an existential problem. Meaning. So people are no longer able to answer the meaning of their own existence. Wallahi, I swear, you will not find it unless you you delve into the Quran. Unless you dive into the Quran. Yeah. And I mean diving, you know. There you're going to find some very, very clear answers. Yeah. So th that crisis is not going to be solved by material stuff or by fame or by, you know, by going to the gym or anything like that. Your spiritual gym is the Quran at the end of the day. Uh, and that's a universal message. It's not our message. You know, it's, the Quran is not owned by the Muslims. It's not my book. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not my prophet as in the sense that I own him. No, he's the prophet of all of humanity. He's the prophet of believers and not believers. Why? Because even a non-believer is part of his ummah. And it says the ummah is divided in two parts. The ummah that believed in him, yeah, ummah to sijaba, they they have answered him. What is nation? Yeah, the community that has answered him are the almost 2 billion Muslims around the world today. But what about the rest, the 6 billion people? Are they not part of the Ummah? 
if they're not the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whose Ummah are they? Is there a Prophet after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. So, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every human being born at his time or after is part of his Ummah. Although, that part of the Ummah is Ummah to Dawah. The Ummah that is still called. They haven't answered the calling. No. So we need to challenge a few uh, wrong ideas sometimes that we as Muslims have. We take the Quran or the Prophet Muhammad as our property. Since when uh, do you own a figure like Muhammad The figure of Prophet Muhammad is too, too, too great to be owned by somebody or by a group of people. Is a universal. Huh? For the whole of humanity. So that includes the text of the Quran. He is sent to the whole of humanity. It includes non-Muslims as part of his ummah. 